Good afternoon. I'm Keith Luce with the National Committee on North Korea. I'm so pleased to invite you to the second in a series of sessions co-hosted by the National Committee on North Korea and the Korea Society regarding the evolving roles of the United Nations on the Korean Peninsula. Today, September 17, is the 30th anniversary of North Korea and South Korea simultaneously joining the United Nations. In a few days, the UN General Assembly will be convening. President Moon Jae-in reportedly will be present, as well as Ambassador Kim Song, the DPRK permanent representative to the United Nations. So here we are, 30 years out, uh, both countries will be represented by high-ranking officials. But what's, what's been accomplished in the last 30 years in terms of the ROK and DPRK being a part of the UN? What are future possibilities in this regard? The Secretary General Guterres uh, issued a statement uh, highlighting his hopes for the future. And I would really like to commend the Secretary General himself because in addition to his responsibilities, his roles in the formal sense of the UN, he has demonstrated a strong commitment to creativity uh, as, as relates to possible solutions of issues on the Korean Peninsula. He is committed to this, whether it be working formally, officially, uh, or behind the scenes. And so I would like to express thanks uh, in that regard. But now, I'm really pleased to turn this program over uh, to my co-host, uh, Steve Norper, who is Senior Director at the Korea Society. Steve? Thank you, Keith. Thanks to Keith Luce, to Esther M, and all at uh, NCNK. Uh, we're delighted to be along this morning to mark the 30th anniversary of the Joint Korean United Nations membership. And we'll be addressing the issues of the United Nations and the Korean peace process. Uh, we're very fortunate today and honored to have with us Teresa Whitfield, the Director of Policy and Mediation at UNDPPA DPO, and as well as to have Frank Januzzi, the President and the CEO of the Mansfield Foundation. Uh, Teresa will speak writ large uh, to the UN and these processes, uh, and uh, Frank will, will tackle the issues specific to the Korean Peninsula and the United Nations. So let's begin, Frank, with you on this uh, historic marking of, of 30 years of the Koreas in the UN and uh, some of your initial thoughts. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you're muted, Frank. I promised I was going to unmute myself. Uh, I live in Baltimore next to a freight line and um, uh, and sure enough, I forgot. Thanks so much, Stephen. Uh, it's my great pleasure to join this program. Uh, I want to speak partly from personal experience as someone who had been involved uh, 30 years ago, not on the Korean Peninsula, but in Cambodia with the UN peacekeeping mission there, and talk about the ways in which I have observed the UN play a constructive role on the Korean Peninsula over the last 30 years. Uh, but I think it, it is very important to consider the context um, uh, this 30 years period really marks a, a significant shift in the UN's engagement on the peninsula from one that was focused on the negative peace goal of preventing war uh, to trying to shift toward Johan Galtung's positive peace concepts of building peace. Um, and it was a construction project only made possible uh, by the admission of both Koreas to the UN 30 years ago. Um, and although I think all of us share the scars and frustrations of 30 years uh, working on the Korean Peninsula without achieving uh, the ultimate objectives of peace and denuclearization that the, the world seeks, I think that today's uh, event is really meant to mark uh, what has been accomplished, what lessons can we draw from it, uh, and what are the many areas of engagement of the UN on the peninsula uh, that are worthy of reinvestment and celebration? Uh, I think that it's important then to note the UN's objectives on the peninsula, which are very broad, right? Uh, ultimately to help facilitate a process of North and South Korea, Korea living you know, in peace side by side 
uh, free from nuclear weapons, free from the threat of war, free from uh, uh, perils uh, toward human security. And, and on a peninsula where human rights are respected and where sustainable development goals of the UN can be advanced. You know, th th these are broad objectives. Uh, and the UN has brought many tools to bear uh, on the peninsula. And I, I wanna celebrate and speak to the three with which I'm most familiar from personal experience as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, traveling to North Korea, meeting with UN officials and observing UN operations on the peninsula. Uh, and those three uh, are uh, first the uh, delivery of emergency food aid uh, and addressing the needs of refugees uh, or uh, immigrants uh, or migrant workers uh, from North Korea in Northeast Asia. Uh, the second, helping to foster positive sum thinking about sustainable development on the Korean Peninsula through projects like the Tumen River Development Program. And third is uh, shining a spotlight on the human rights concerns, especially profound uh, in the DPRK. And these are all areas where uh, in my personal life, I've had an opportunity to observe the UN up close and personal on the, on the peninsula. I wanna speak first to my first visit to the DPRK in 2001, um, uh, which came in the context of uh, famine on the peninsula, uh, uh, profound concerns about food security, uh, malnutrition that was endemic, um, and a ramping up of international efforts to try to meet the need in a way that was monitored and, and uh, verifiable. And uh, upon arrival in Pyongyang, I was struck by the fact that the UN was one of the few uh, bodies uh, with international legitimacy you know, that had a presence in the DPRK, a presence again made possible uh, by the North Korean, South Korean admission to the UN you know, in, in 1991. Um, and that UN office there in Pyongyang, coordinating food aid, UNICEF operations, World Food Program operations, was a hub of knowledge about the DPRK and, and, and a hub of positive uh, experience of how to work with the DPRK government to actually get things done. Um, and for those who say that nothing can ever get done in DPRK, I mean, they should just really have, have observed the, the biscuit factories churning out uh, food for children, uh, they should have observed uh, the, the sustainable energy projects, pilot projects uh, uh, facilitated through the UN office um, to get a sense of what is possible uh, on the peninsula when uh, there's the right spirit and the right expertise. Uh, that same spirit of positive engagement, I think, can be seen in the Tumen River Development Program. Um, Back in 1995, when the UNDP uh, culminated three years of quiet diplomacy uh, by inking the agreement to establish the Tumen River Development Program, you know, this was the first intergovernmental uh, agreement for development in Northeast Asia. Uh, it was really uh, uh, marked uh, an era of post-Cold War thinking. Soviet Union had collapsed. China had normalized diplomatic relations with the ROK. You know, there was a, a new sense of what is possible in terms of avoiding zero-sum thinking and moving toward positive-sum thinking um, about uh, the Korean Peninsula. And the reason I think that the Tumen River Development Program is important is not because it, it's uh, uh, somehow magically transformed that region into an area of prosperity and, and development, because there are still huge challenges, although the region has advanced a lot. Um, it's because of the 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 thinking that is embodied in such projects. It, it's the difference between a passive approach of trying to monitor a ceasefire uh, and hold nations accountable for ceasefire violations, something the UN has done with great success on the Korean Peninsula for 70 years, um, and working to build the institutions, the connections, the investments uh, that, that establish the conditions for positive peace. Um, I think that the UN's role uh, on the armistice, the UN's role monitoring uh, uh, ceasefire violations is very well chronicled and very well understood by the international community. And, and I, I hope acknowledged also as meaningful because we've had 70 years uh, uh, of experience on the peninsula and we've never had an escalation uh, from a uh, lethal incident on the peninsula into a general conflict. And I think that the UN deserves a lot of credit 
uh, for establishing the kind of uh, uh, guardrails and buffers and communication channels and safeguards to prevent escalation of conflict on the peninsula. Uh, but efforts to construct the positive peace get a lot less attention. Um, and it's all about the human dimension to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, this is something I observed along the North Korea-China border with the very quiet role um, uh, by UN agencies to try to address the needs of North Koreans inside China who are subject to refoulement, um, uh, who are subject to mistreatment and abuse inside of China, uh, and, the, and the quiet efforts of the UN uh, and UN agencies to try to address the needs of such individuals uh, is something also uh, that deserves uh, recognition. Greatest frustrations there always are that the, the UN is only able to operate within the parameters that are given by the, the UN Security Council and, and the members of the UN. So if the Chinese government refuses you know, to, to address uh, uh, the issue of North Korean uh, migrants inside China, in the way that the UN um, uh, High Commissioner for Refugees would like. Um, uh, the, UN, the UN is not empowered to, to tell Beijing uh, what to do uh, on that. They have to use moral suasion. The third area, is, it sort of brings me to the third area that I'm personally familiar with, which is on the human rights front. Uh, it, it has been the US position for many years that the, the key to solving the problems in the Crimean Peninsula is all about denuclearization. And the, the UN has contributed massively toward that objective uh, through the efforts of the Secretary General, through the uh, active uh, mediation efforts at times of, of uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Um, uh, but, but it's also, uh, I think, uh, true uh, that the, the nuclear issue is only one dimension of the problem. Uh, uh, as was true in Cambodia, you had a civil war, but you have many, many other aspects of the situation in Cambodia that the UN tried to address in terms of development and protection of human rights and chronicling of human rights abuses and, and holding accountable those responsible for the most egregious human rights abuses that constituted crimes against humanity. And the UN in 2013 created the, the, uh, the High Commission uh, uh, on, on, on Human Rights uh, Commission of Inquiry. Uh, into the DPRK. Uh, and its report um, uh, is a landmark document, you know, chronicling uh, the, the uh, litany of human rights abuses uh, that take place in the DPRK and attempts for the first time to really not only chronicle them, but also to begin to uh, set in motion a process by which uh, the people on the Korean Peninsula can ultimately hold those responsible. Um, for human rights abuses accountable for their actions and, and also set in motion uh, a process under their own power uh, of, of uh, uh, reconciliation and peace. And uh, so I think that uh, uh, Judge Kirby deserves a lot of credit um, for shining a spotlight on the human security, human rights dimension to the Korean Peninsula problem. And again, this is something that would not have happened uh, without without UN leadership. And what's most interesting about it to me, Stephen uh, and Keith, uh, is, is that, um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and Teresa, is, is that the, the, the DPRK took this process seriously. They may not have liked it. I think no country likes to have their human rights record put up for international scrutiny. The US certainly uh, is, is gun shy about subjecting ourselves to, to the scrutiny of the international community on our human rights uh, abuses and problems. Uh, but the DPRK has taken their commitments uh, uh, to the UN bodies seriously. They have sent high level officials to New York to explain their side of the story. Um, and um, I think this is a measure of the seriousness with which the DPRK itself judges the UN. You know, they, they see the UN as a legitimate body of which they are a member. Uh, and therefore they, they cannot afford to scoff uh, at UN pronouncements, whether they are from the General Assembly or the Security Council. So I've taken up too much time, but let me close by just saying a couple of things, uh, again, uh, uh, from a perspective of a former US government worker uh, who, who uh, uh, was trying to understand what was happening inside North Korea. Uh, I, I think that the, the UN is a, is a remarkable body of expertise on the UN, having had staff uh, working inside the country for decades, uh, I hope that the UN can soon restore uh, its presence in Pyongyang. 
uh, because I think that the, the building of a positive peace uh, on the Korean Peninsula is, is something that is vital and is something that the UN um, uh, is better positioned to do than any other body. Um, and along the way, the UN has facilitated dialogue and communication among the parties on, on the most sensitive of issues. And I hope that the UN would get back to, if, 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 if in fact, I think it's moved away from a little bit in recent years, get back to a more active um, uh, facilitating role. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, the US tends to say that the, the ball is in North Korea's court, the North Koreans say the ball is in the US court, but from where I sit, the ball's stuck in the net and somebody has to go get it and put it in play. And, and I think that the UN can help do that uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, facilitating, encouraging, and, and uh, 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 maybe catalyzing a dialogue uh, in ways that the parties themselves uh, uh, may not. Uh, you know, sustaining peace is not the same as building peace. Um, uh, the absence of war is not the same as the presence of peace. Um, and the UN needs <clears throat> today on the peninsula, I think, uh, uh, to keep that in mind um, as it strives uh, to help the international community um, get beyond where we are today uh, and get to, to, to where we want to be. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks. Uh, thank you to Frank Genuzzi and Teresa Whitfield. Thank you so much uh, to both to the Korea Society and the NCNK for having me today. I'm really pleased to be, we, to be with you. And I'm honored really to join you on this 30th anniversary of the two Koreas being admitted to the United Nations. While celebrating this milestone, I think we all acknowledge the history of division on the peninsula, but also join Secretary General Guterres in wishing for lasting peace and prosperity for all the people across the Korean peninsula. I should clarify from the outset that I'm no career expert, but I have been working in or around the UN as a UN official with NGOs and as an academic on issues related to peacemaking for just over the 30 years that the two Koreas have been members of the organization. I'd therefore like to take this opportunity to share with you a few thoughts on the evolution of UN peacemaking, highlighting what has changed in this very eventful period, as well as some of the constants. My hope would be that these brief reflections help spark discussion on possibilities for support by UN and other third parties that might contribute to actions to break the current stalemate on the peninsula. 1991, of course, was an exciting moment for the UN. Beyond the two Koreas, the end of the Cold War transformed the Security Council and facilitated the resolution of many conflicts. The results were seen in a series of peace agreements and large multidimensional peacekeeping operations to implement them. In Southeast Asia, in Cambodia, where we just heard Frank serve, in Southern Africa, Mozambique, Namibia and Angola, and in Central America, El Salvador and Guatemala, which is where I, I came into this work. This golden age of UN peacemaking didn't last. During the 1990s, the UN had a series of crises and failures in Rwanda, the Balkans and Somalia, before rebounding with new engagements in East Timor, Kosovo and across Africa. 9-11 and the global war of, on terrorism, and then the Arab Spring and its fallout brought new challenges and new missions. By the middle of the last decade, however, as violent conflicts became more intractable, more tangled in regional, regional and geopolitics and more fragmented, there was a realization that the post-Cold War model for which the UN was known, the negotiation of peace agreements, then peacekeeping and their implementation had serious problems. In 2015, major reviews of UN peace operations, peace building and our work on women, peace and security where implementation of the groundbreaking Security Council Resolution 1325, adopted in 2000, had been lagging, contributed to a significant shift away from a linear approach to peacemaking and what was termed post-conflict peacebuilding to a more expansive approach to sustaining peace with prevention at its core. This wider, more integrated approach has characterized the first term of Secretary General Antonio, Antonio Guterres and can be seen in the far reaching parameters of the proposals for our common agenda he has just put before the General Assembly. This shift means that those of us in the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs who are thinking about peacemaking are doing so within a much broader framework than before. 
we are conscious that the goal of sustainable peace needs us to be thinking about human rights, women and inclusion, but also about the environment and the disruptive effects of climate change. We need to be thinking about development, issues of political economy and public health, and we need to be prioritizing innovation and digital technologies and working much more actively with colleagues across the UN system, as well as partners outside the UN than we might have done in the past. At the same time, there are a number of characteristics of UN peacemaking that have been and will remain constant, rooted in the organization's charter and founding purpose to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. These characteristics include the UN's impartiality, its steadfast championing of norms, rights and values, peaceful solutions and diplomacy consistent with international law, and its openness to dialogue and communication with all, and thus readiness to serve as a trusted channel. Much of this work falls under the broad description of good offices, whether conducted by the Secretary General himself, and so far they have been himself, or the envoys, representatives and officials working on his behalf. As described by a former colleague, Tamrat Samuel, who had long years of experience in Asia, where he had a critical role in developing UN engagement in East Timor and later Nepal by fostering relationships with parties to each conflict, good offices is a very broad term for any third party assistance given to conflicting parties to help find a solution to their problems. It can take many different forms. For example, it may include, but is not necessarily limited to mediation. The role could involve advising parties to a conflict or governments, carrying messages between opposing sides or facilitating contact between groups without necessarily directly injecting oneself into the process also providing specialized expertise to discussions and generally being a catalyst. In essence, you have a range of choices within the broad concept of a good officer. What these choices mean in practice has varied greatly. There are numerous examples of good offices initiatives undertaken by Secretaries General themselves. Secretary General Uthant's role in preventing nuclear confrontation over the Cuban mi Missile Crisis, for example, or Secretary General Perez de Cuellar's initiative to end the Iran-Iraq war in 1997. But the quiet diplomacy of the Secretary General or his envoys and officials often takes place behind closed doors or in support of others. It is predicated on the UN's ability to talk to anyone, its patience to build relationships and trust, and to understand positions and seek opportunities to pursue peaceful solutions. It is supported by an open offer for dialogue and a readiness to provide capacity building on a wide range of areas. Sometimes a good officer's role may, be in, may involve the naming of a dedicated envoy. In 2008, for example, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon appointed former Nigerian President Obasanjo as special envoy for the Great Lakes in response to growing tensions and a fear of regional war breaking out in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. Elsewhere, a succession of personal representatives of different secretaries general offered good offices to resolve the, quote, name dispute between Greece and what is now North Macedonia, or address the border controversy between Guyana and Venezuela. But even an envoy does not need to be tied to a process of negotiation. As the personal envoy of the secretary general from 2003 to 2005, Mr. Maurice Strong, working with the support of the then Department of Political Affairs, led support for the international response to the DPRK's humanitarian development needs as an essential contribution to the prospects for a peaceful settlement. Good offices are also carried out more informally. Many participants in this webinar may recall that in December 2017, at a particularly tense and dangerous moment, Secretary General Guterres sent my former boss, Under Secretary General Jeff Feltman, to Pyongyang. As the first in-depth political exchange of views between the UN Secretariat and DPRK in almost eight years, his visit sought to contribute to de-escalation of tension and to encourage greater engagement by the DPRK with the UN. US Chief Feltman went to Pyongyang in the context of our wider objective, maintained by the current Under Secretary General, Rosemary DiCarlo, for DPPA and the UN 
to contribute to efforts to reach a peaceful negotiated solution of the outstanding issues on the Korean Peninsula, with a priority on supporting efforts to build trust, reduce tension, and engage in dialogue. To do this, we have established a program to support cooperation in Northeast Asia with vital support from Finland, New Zealand, Switzerland, and Sweden. I'd be happy to discuss this further in the Q&A if we have time. To finish up, with the gravity and complexity of the challenges on the Korean Peninsula, it would be easy to feel overwhelmed and question what anyone can realistically do. Ambassador Samantha Power, now of course heading up USAID, has talked about the book she's given to many colleagues, Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard. The authors, Chip and Dan Heath, argue, perhaps counterintuitively, that big problems are most often solved by a sequence of small solutions, sometimes over weeks, sometimes over decades. It is these small solutions that we should all seek to find while welcoming big solutions too if they come our way. The breadth of resources and capacity present within the UN system, its impartiality and its patience mean that it is uniquely placed to be a consistent and predictable long-term partner on the long and difficult path to peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. Uh, I have a question for each of you before we uh, turn to our general questions uh, with Keith Luce. Uh, Frank, you talked about uh, the, the issues as they affect Korea's. And uh, I wonder if you could say a bit more, uh, one about South Korean leadership within the UN. Uh, South Korea has played really almost an outsized role having uh, done a number of things at the UN, having uh, served on, on two of the permanent committees, having had two rotations as president of the Security Council during the rotation uh, in hosting the Green Climate Fund uh, and the UN uh, Human Rights Center in Seoul. Uh, if you could say a bit uh, about that, and, and you also uh, do posit the concerns uh, about North Korea. Certainly, we know those in terms of the concerns about uh, missile and nuclear development, uh, the sanctions regime. Uh, but also, if you could say a few words about, uh, one, the, the imprimatur the UN uh, brings to North Korea. They seem to respect that. They seem to find uh, that the UN is, is genuine and uh, they're able to function within it uh, uh, fairly well. And also uh, the mm. idea of engagement as well, especially given what you've said about the development front and the development needs that accompany the security concerns. And Teresa, if I could ask you about this point that uh, uh, Frank has made about capacity within the professional ranks uh, at the United Nations. Uh, and I know you talked about capacity building in terms of on the ground, uh, uh, so critical and so important, uh, but also for member states, uh, the capacity of what the UN brings to them uh, as a resource uh, on uh, the Koreas. And especially given what Frank said about the fact that there's no UN representation right now in the DPRK, uh, but the importance that that brings uh, for the international community. Uh, so Frank, uh, why don't we turn first to you? Thanks, Stephen. Um, briefly, because the questions you raise are important, but um, could be subject of their own seminar. Uh, you know, the ROK role within the UN uh, has really been, as you say, outsized uh, for what is, uh, in the international context, a middle power. Uh, and um, whether it's from climate change initiatives uh, and leadership there, uh, to hosting the UN Human Rights Center in Seoul, uh, uh, something that was really quite a brave political decision on the part of the ROK uh, uh, in terms of uh, facilitating that UN uh, investigatory and spotlight shining role uh, in Seoul, um, uh, or whether it's its own participation and support for UN peacekeeping operations globally. Uh, the, U the ROK has gone from a aid recipient country to an aid donor. Uh, country uh, in the last 30 years. This is part of uh, ROK's own remarkable transformation during this period of UN membership. Um, and uh, of course, let's not forget that it also lent uh, one of its citizens, Ban Ki-moon, to the leadership of the UN, um, uh, where he served with, with distinction, including on issues relating to the Korean Peninsula. Um, and I, I do want to address then that DPRK uh, attitude about the, the UN and, and its engagement with the UN. Uh, we didn't mention um, the area of disabilities and, and the UN's efforts on promoting the rights of the disabled. 
uh, and the DPRK's own positive sum engagement with the UN uh, in assessing its own policies, laws, and uh, treaty obligations um, toward the disabled in the DPRK. This remarkable sort of uh, willingness of the DPRK to subject their own internal uh, social system, public health, um, government policies system to outside um, review and you know th there's there's the the common wisdom uh, that the DPRK um, uh, adopts a Chinese attitude about uh, matters of uh, internal affairs being outside the scrutiny and legitimate comment of the international community. In reality, it's more complex than that. Uh, because I think there is a willingness on the part of the DPRK um, to uh, address global norms in some areas, uh, as long as they don't feel that uh, uh, the, the standards are being applied to them only. And I think it goes to what Teresa uh, hinted at in her comments, uh, actually said explicitly, which is that the impartiality of the UN, its adherence to norms and values, as opposed to uh, uh, choosing sides and picking on one only um, to try to uh, uh, hold them to one standard. Uh, this is part of what gives the UN legitimacy in the eyes of, of the DPRK government um, uh, and makes possible uh, positive engagements on, on things like the rights of the disabled um, in, the, in the DPRK. Thanks. Th thanks, Frank. And Teresa? Thanks so much. I mean, obviously, the COVID pandemic has made what was already difficult even more difficult. And our offices in the DPRK remain open with national staff and the wider UN system and international staff continue to work remotely, um, doing what we can for the benefits of the people of the DPRK and looking forward to being able to get back in. Um, so, so, so that's one thing. Other kinds of contacts from from DPR from from us in DPPA, there is a kind of constant contact through the permanent mission here in New York at all different levels, and those continue smoothly. Um, and more in-person direct contacts will will resume once travel becomes a bit more easily. Um, on the the point about expertise, perhaps I can just describe some of the things that we've done over the past few years, which give a sense of the range of of expertise that we can link up to, because there's both the sort of there's expertise that we have within the department, and then obviously we work very closely with our partners across the UN to link up with with others. And just in the last few years, we've facilitated the participation of DPRK representatives in a, in a conference on Northeast Asian issues in Hel in Helsinki, in workshops in Cambodia on trust building and making peace in the Asia Pacific region on women, peace and security. We organized a seminar on treaty law and practice, um, a capacity building meeting on human rights. And interesting because it's got such a huge issue um, uh, in thinking about the environment and the, the impacts of climate change and how that's going to play out in future years. Also in a forum of the Northeast Asia Desertification Land Degradation and Drought Network in, in um, I think that was back in December 2019. So there's just a range of different things that, 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 that we can engage in conversations and help build capacity and and link uh, people up with other people. Thanks. Thanks, Teresa. And now over to uh, Keith Luce, who will uh, be moderating the questions from our distinguished audience. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Teresa. Keith. Thanks, Steve. And thanks to, to Frank and Teresa. It's uh, really a privilege to be with both of our guests today. Uh, Teresa is an accomplished uh, peacemaker, has quite a track record. It was my privilege to serve at the Foreign Relations Committee uh, with Frank Januzzi. Uh, and I would say that at that time, there was no Senate staffer who knew more about Northeast Asia uh, and North Korea and the peninsula than Frank. So it's a privilege to have him with us today as well. Uh, just to remind folks, as Esther sent around, that if you have questions, please submit those uh, through the Q&A function. Uh, we have a number ready to go here. Uh, you know, Steve made reference to South Korea's involvement at the UN, its activities. Uh, Teresa, Frank, what can you say, how would you characterize North Korea's interaction with the United Nations? Uh, Frank, would you go first? 
Uh, sure, and Keith, it's so great to see you and, and uh, to have had the honor to serve with you on the Foreign Relations Committee and to travel together to the DPRK uh, with you uh, on more than once. Uh, so I think you know, as well as I do, Keith, uh, that the DPRK's engagement with the UN um, uh, takes many forms. Um, and there will be times when it's a uh, truculent uh, uh, defiance. Uh, uh, if, if there's a UN Security Council resolution on sanctions uh, uh, that the DPRK finds objectionable, uh, then there can be an attitude of truculence um, uh, to a, an attitude of, of uh, cooperation uh, to the point of working out uh, detailed methodologies for uh, uh, verification of food aid deliveries or or work with UN officials on the ground inside the country, facilitating travel, uh, 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 dealing with uh, health emergencies uh, in a way that's extremely cordial and, and full of, of trust and rapport. Uh, so I think uh, we, we can't use one word to describe the DPRK's interactions with the UN, but I think that a common uh, characteristic is that the UN is not ignored by the DPRK. Um, uh, there's a, a sense that the UN matters uh, and that the UN's engagement on the peninsula matters. And, and very often, I think the DPRK views the, the UN and the UN bodies um, as, as uh, bodies that have greater legitimacy than either unilateral US or US allied multilateral bodies um, that the, the, the DPRK tends to view with greater suspicion as just a manifestation of, of, of their, their concern about America's hostile policy, as they call it, uh, toward the DPRK. So, so the, the, the DPRK officials that I've known um, have an attitude toward the UN uh, that uh, runs the gamut in terms of uh, the, the particular issue on which they're engaging, uh, but is always marked by a degree of respect for the body uh, and a degree of an understanding um, that the UN uh, could be uh, and has been uh, catalytic in helping to make progress on tough issues on the peninsula. And the final thought on this, Keith, is just that, you know, the DPRK's uh, approach to the UN, I think, is sort of like the, the UN's approach to the peninsula. Uh, it's about turning the impossible into the very unlikely, you know, to, to, to take what seems to be an insurmountable challenge and then uh, uh, as, as Teresa was saying, maybe break it into pieces, parts, uh, and, and find ways uh, to, to make incremental progress. And, and that's been the track record, I think, of the UN on the peninsula. Teresa? Thank you. I mean, obviously, there are all sorts of different bits in of the UN. But from our perspective in DPPA, we, we find that the DPRK has been very cooperative working with the Secretariat. And for example, speaking of the sustainable development goals, uh, the DPRK submitted a voluntary national review as part of the review, uh, review processes, and it participates actively within multilateral fora. So I would never, never presume to speak to what the DPRK thinks of the UN, but what we see is, is engagement and, and uh, participation within the multilateral uh, opportunities that it, that it has. Thank you, thanks to both. Um, actually, the DPRK presence at the UN uh, also serves uh, as sort of an unofficial embassy to the United States, right? Uh, given the fact that the US and the DPRK do not have diplomatic relations. Now, some will refer to the DPR commission DPR mission as the back channel. Uh, sometimes it's the only channel. Sometimes it's not the channel uh, in terms of the US. Uh, the United States has the benefit of Sweden serving as the protector of US interests uh, in the DPRK. Sweden is also uh, part of the United Nations. Uh, sometimes the North Koreans will choose to connect with the United States other than the channel through the UN, perhaps through Singapore or wherever. But uh, I agree with both of you that uh, their presence uh, in, in terms of the UN is important. It, it, the UN provides a critical base of interaction, uh, not only between the DPRK and the US, but, but with other countries as well. But let, let, just talking about the United States for a moment, Frank, uh, over the years, you've witnessed the attitude of Congress 
toward the United Nations as an institution. Um, how would you summarize the, the present perspective of Congress the best that you can as relates to the United Nations, but also the degree to which the United Nations might play a role regarding the uh, peaceful resolution of issues with the DPRK? Well, thanks for the question, Keith, and thanks for your reminder that the importance of the New York Channel, as, as the State Department calls it, uh, which provides the United States State Department with an, a way to communicate reliably in most circumstances with the DPRK through their, their mission in New York. Uh, in the absence of an embassy, in the absence of liaison offices in Pyongyang or Washington, D.C., uh, that New York Channel has played a huge uh, role in, in resolving issues large and small. Uh, from the uh, arrest of U.S. citizens uh, and their uh, ultimately uh, negotiating their release from the DPRK uh, to helping to arrange six-party talks and four-party talks and bilateral talks uh, between the U.S. and DPRK officials. Uh, in terms of the congressional attitudes about the U.N., you know, it's fair to say that the, the, the members of Congress uh, on the whole uh, tend to be leery of international organizations because they worry about how the U.S. may somehow yield sovereignty or yield measures of sovereignty to international bodies. Uh, but those on the uh, Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate and the House um, see the positive sum of international organizations and what the United States gets uh, by investing in bodies like the U.N. So when you could get people like Jesse Helms, uh, the former conservative Republican from North Carolina, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, working alongside Joe Biden, uh, who then the ranking member of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, on a package to pay America's debt to the UN um, in, the, in the late 1990s. The reason they did that, the reason they were able to reach that landmark agreement to pay the arrearages that the US owed to the UN was because uh, there was consensus across the aisle that the UN was an organization that matters and that was capable of doing good work. Uh, and that the UN was shouldering burdens that would otherwise fall exclusively on the shoulders of the United States. Uh, but that the UN provided a mechanism by which those peacekeeping, peace building, um, conflict avoidance, conflict prevention duties uh, could be farmed out to the international community and shared um, in, in a way that brought more resources, more expertise, uh, more international engagement. So I don't think that we are at a moment in the United States political history where faith in international organizations is, is, uh, you know, is high, um, uh, but neither are we at a point where faith is at a nadir. Um, and, and I think that uh, I, I hope uh, that more members of Congress will appreciate that in the UN, uh, the United States has uh, a partner of which we are, of course, a, a leading member um, um, that can do things we can't, you know, and, and I think that's the realization that came to Jesse Helms um, in the late 1990s um, that led him to work to, to uh, restore uh, America's support for the UN, uh, even at a time when uh, congressional su uh, support for other aspects of UN operations uh, might, might be better characterized as skeptical. Well, thank you. Uh, Teresa and then Frank, let's get into the issue of humanitarian diplomacy. Uh, what is the prospect of the United Nations uh, having a key role related to humanitarian diplomacy on the peninsula as a whole? Now, it's a given that there is significant need within North Korea as, as we meet. Uh, it's a given that the, that the South Koreans are prepared to provide assistance to the North. Uh, American U.S. NGOs uh, are prepared to provide assistance. And in, in fact, I should add that uh, uh, this, despite the lack of track one interaction between the U.S. and the DPRK, there are a number of American NGOs who do remain in contact with the North Koreans and they with them. And those channels remain open, which is very positive. But looking at the future, considering the, the COVID situation, uh, food, et, et cetera, what, what is the possible role of the United Nations? Now, this is complex because within the United Nations, there are multiple entities. There's also been the issue in the past of the degree to which the United Nations would share information with American and other NGOs working in the North. This used to be a criticism of American NGOs that the, North, that, that the United Nations 
wouldn't share information on the ground activities, et cetera. That's all changed now. Uh, the United Nations, in, in my opinion, does actively engage with, with NCNK, I know with American NGOs, there is this commitment, I believe, to sharing information, which is positive. But now a, a, another cautionary note here is with the North Korean see an effort at humanitarian diplomacy as being an effort at uh, leveraging negotiations or, or leveraging uh, some sort of, of resolution. So, Teresa, uh, well, let's hear from you first. Thank you. Um, I think we have to be very clear about the, the, the UN principles for humanitarian assistance and the prioritization of humanitarian assistance to assist the people of North Korea or indeed to assist people in other places where we're engaged and not really confuse it with, with, with diplomacy per se. Um, that said, and I see there's a question in the chat about COVID, and there's been, you know, uh, 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 we're challenged by not being in the country, as I mentioned before, but at the same time, we're working with the government to address the humanitarian impact of the global outbreak, um, of the global outbreak, recognizing that there are no reported cases um, in the DPRK. This includes a COVID response plan, um, addressing the health concerns and capacity, as well as broader issues, uh, humanitarian issues related, related to food security, health, nutrition, water, sanitation, and those kind of issues. Um, this has been a priority since the COVID outbreak began in 2020, and we're also working on supporting access for COVID-19 vaccines through the WHO and Gavi-led COVAX facility. So there's, there's quite a lot going on. Um, but as I said at the beginning, we, it, we are, our, our work is impeded by not having uh, the staff that we would like to have on the ground, and we're looking forward to that um, regaining. Um, and, and we think maybe the, va the vaccination, vaccination effort might, pri might provide an opportunity for us, us to return. Frank? Well, thanks, Keith. Uh, you know, the UN's role on food aid in particular uh, was really significant uh, because uh, the UN was able to negotiate protocols with the DPRK that provided measures of assurance that went beyond those uh, that the DPRK was prepared uh, to provide for much of the bilateral assistance. Um, and I think that was because of the, the, the institutional weight of the UN, as well as the amount of resources that the WFP brought to bear uh, to address the crisis. And, and the ability to go in and do post-aid monitoring and evaluation of children, uh, you know, taking upper arm uh, measurements and such. And forgive me, there is a train going by. Um, all, all of that um, uh, spoke to the fact that the UN had capability inside the North that, that, that uh, smaller NGOs uh, might not be able to, to negotiate. On the other hand, as you point out, Keith, uh, the, the, the role of NGOs, uh, oftentimes deep in the field, um, is something that um, maybe uh, there, there's opportunity for more partnership there with the UN in terms of information sharing, uh, sharing of experience, sharing uh, what works. Um, and, and the fact that those communication channels are better now than they used to be, I think, is, is true. Uh, and, and I hope that if the UN is able to ramp up uh, its uh, office again in, in Pyongyang post-COVID, um, and, and perhaps have more field projects, uh, that, that there can be even deeper linkages between the NGO community and the UN, because, because it's really the two working together that, that uh, amplifies uh, the role of the international community in trying to, to build sustainable development uh, inside North Korea. Um, let me leave it at that. I, I do see that there's a, a good, several good questions in the, in the chat box, and I hope we can get to them. I'll try to keep my answers short. All right. Um, let's, for a moment, uh, talk about other thematic issues. We've discussed humanitarian diplomacy. What about climate change? You know, is this an issue where the UN could be involved with the peninsula as a whole? And I should add, uh, if North Korea is willing, right? Uh, the South Korea is obviously willing to engage in a number of issues related to the DPRK. The North is, is hesitant presently uh, for a number of reasons uh, related to engagement. But uh, let's talk about climate change. Is that a viable prospect for diplomacy? Teresa? 
just a, a broad comment on the, the escalation of the climate emergency and the ways in which we're seeing it increasingly crossing over into our, our efforts in the field of peace and security. It's become a priority area for our work on political issues and that in elsewhere across Africa and in other places we're working with with member states on these issues that, that the vari variegated impacts of climate change on security of very different kinds is, 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 a, is a huge issue and a priority area of work. Certainly the, the, the challenges of climate change to the peninsula and, and the environmental degradation and uh, all the wide range of issues I think do offer uh, uh, an opportunity for functional cooperation that can help us build relations as well as as and an, an, as perhaps even a stepping stone to other issues. The Secretary General identified climate change and the environment as a key area of cooperation during a video message he sent to the Korea Global Forum for Peace, which I think was just back in August. Um, and I think there is also an opportunity to engage in, in transnational environment, environmental cooperation. Kim Jong-un reiterated in September that he was just as early this month, that he was focused on improving land management and minimizing natural disasters. So, so maybe there is um, a possibility of doing more there. I would certainly hope so. Frank. No. But, uh, climate change will hit the DPRK harder than it hits most countries. And, and so uh, there's a, a real interest inside the DPRK in moving toward uh, renewable energy. Um, uh, there's a real push inside the DPRK on issues of, of reforestation uh, and desertification. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a prime topic on which to engage. Uh, but Keith, I think that you and I have experienced the, the great frustration uh, from Pyongyang, which is that on occasion, um, positive engagement on topics of clear mutual interest can be held hostage uh, to um, movement on uh, political disputes and security issues, which are not directly um, related. Uh, but the linkages are there in terms of the attitudes of the DPRK towards the international community. And, and um, navigating that requires uh, great patience. So let's talk about China for a moment. One of the questions refers to China's treatment of North Koreans who make their way into China. Uh, in the past, the Chinese would often refer to North Korean refugees, shall we say, or escapees. Uh, as economic migrants. And through the years, the Chinese have often uh, not simply taken a neutral attitude, but often a hostile attitude toward North Koreans who, who, who go into China, even to the point that when the North Koreans make their way into Thailand or Laos, wherever, the, the Chinese try to pull them back out to return them to the North. So what has the UN done about this in the past? And, and is there a role for the UN in the future uh, to be involved in this area, Frank or Teresa? Whoever would like to tackle that. I typed a partial answer to the really excellent question from Sean King about this um, in the chat box. And, and let me say, add to it by saying that, um, you know, the UN's taken a lot of heat uh, for its inability to persuade China to fulfill its commitments uh, to screen all North Korean um, migrants or those who have entered the country illegally uh, and, and, and assess their applicability uh, for, for asylum or refuge uh, and to not refoul them uh, into a circumstance where they're, they're likely to face abuse and punishment. And, and, and I will say in the UN's defense um, that I know that solemn representations have been made to Beijing about the issue um, and that uh, the ability of the UN to convince China to fully abide by its international commitments, you know, is only as strong as the resolve of the members of the UN and the UN Security Council in backing up those representations in their own diplomatic engagement with Beijing. Um, and on this issue, I would hope that the US could, could have a quiet but meaningful back channel to Beijing, uh, because it is very much in China's interests um, uh, not to refoul uh, North Koreans into a situation where they were going to be in harm's way. 
Um, and in my experience, Keith, uh, 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 at times, quiet diplomacy has actually worked. Uh, there have been moments when, when the Chinese have behaved better uh, with respect to uh, uh, both helping to prevent abuses against North Koreans inside China and also not uh, rounding up and repatriating uh, uh, North Koreans uh, to, to uh, uh, send them back to the DPRK uh, without um, having allowed them uh, to, to be processed in a way that they're supposed to be processed under international law. I, I don't know if Teresa is familiar with the, the UN's efforts on this area, but but I, I would I would be happy to learn more. Well, I I just add very briefly because I know time's quite short. Um, the the UN Special Rapporteur Thomas Quintana is actively engaged on this issue, and both Special Rapporteur reports and Secretary General's reports have encouraged China to refrain from re repatriating DPRK um, citizens. So, uh, but I'd agree, and with Frank's comments in the chat as well, this is a really delicate and difficult issue, but, but we are working on it. Thanks, Teresa and Frank. Uh, one of the questions uh, relates to COVID-19 vaccine, and Teresa's already addressed this to some degree, uh, re related to the prospect of delivery of vaccine to Pyongyang, will patent issues prevent uh, a Moderna vaccine production plant for the country? Uh, very possibly. Uh, there are, you know, uh, the, it, it was announced some time ago that um, North Korea, by Gavi, that North Korea was eligible to receive uh, many doses of vaccine, enough in fact to, to provide for three to 4% of the population initially. Uh, but there have been challenges, and a lot of those challenges have come from the North Korean side. The, the inability or unwillingness of North Korea to perhaps agree to all of the criteria that, that have been outlined. However, uh, I think North Korea is showing some flexibility. So in answer to this question, I think it's impossible to, to definitely say one way or the other that the patent issue will be a game changer or a game, or a game killer in this case. Uh, I just think it remains to be seen what may be worked out between the DPRK and the international community. We have another question, uh, the European community, European Union submits a resolution condemning the human rights situation in North Korea to the third committee of the UN General Assembly every year. They will be submitting the resolution this year prior to the upcoming UNGA. In terms of this, how significant do you think is the EU's role within the UN? Frank? EU role is very important within both the UN and in its engagement with the DPRK uh, across the board, including on human rights issues. And there have been numerous EU delegations uh, to the DPRK. Um, and I think, again, this is one of those situations where multilateralism uh, is more effective sometimes than uh, bilateral talks. Uh, for the U.S. to engage uh, bilaterally with the DPRK on, on human rights issues is extraordinarily difficult. Ambassador uh, Bob King, uh, you know, did his best, but but my God, it was a struggle uh, because because the DPRK tends to view such engagement in the context of, of, of what again as what they perceive as a U.S. hostile policy. Whereas the EU engagement is coming from countries, all of whom, most of whom, have diplomatic relations with the DPRK, have embassies in Pyongyang, uh, and 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 the voices of this multilateral community uh, on on issues of human rights. I think uh, resonates more powerfully. Uh, with uh, Pyongyang than, than uh, does uh, U.S. Uh, unilateral uh, uh, objections or, or voices of concern. Teresa, any comments? No, I agree entirely with that. Um, and uh, the, the, the breadth of multilateral engagement, including but also beyond the EU, um, is, is extremely helpful. So, Teresa, the six-party talks. As you know, in the past, the six-party talks uh, was an important project, hoping to uh, resolve issues related to the DPRK. Uh, in, in the halls, uh, which you wander and work, uh, have you heard any reference to uh, the six-party talks again resuming? I think that, I mean, for us from the UN, we engage with all the regional, and we, we engage with actors across Northeast Asia and beyond who are concerned on North Korea. We consistently advocate dialogue and engagement and negotiation and look forward to that restarting um, whenever is possible. But the format in which it takes is, is really up to the parties concerned. Um, and and we, we will look forward to working on dialogue and supporting whatever may, may develop. Frank? 
Uh, I agree with very much with Teresa, and, and I would just add that you know, it seems to me that um, the, the UN has uh, at, at least three sort of uh, uh, areas where it can uh, think about doing more. Uh, one is the, the involvement of the Secretary General himself. Um, Teresa has spoken to the, to the important good offices role. Uh, I think it, it, it uh, again, uh, it, at a time when international diplomatic efforts seem to be stymied, uh, I, I think there's a, a window there for the Secretary General perhaps uh, to, to offer good offices. Uh, second is the Security Council, where I think that the, it's a very important for the United States uh, to, to help set in motion a way to overcome the paralysis in the Security Council uh, caused by the Russia-China-US split. Uh, uh, this is counterproductive to international efforts to advance peace building on the Korean Peninsula, uh, and, and the US needs to find a way to work with China, with Russia, despite all of our you know, concerns about other areas um, uh, to advance common interests because the UN will be liberated in terms of what it can do if, if the Security Council can be more unified uh, in its approach on the peninsula. It, it's been unified in some areas, but, but it, 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 it's been stymied in others. Um, and, and then finally, I think uh, this goes really to, to Teresa's forte and what she has highlighted in today's program, uh, which is that the UN is so well positioned to do not just uh, uh, you know, peace monitoring, but conflict, conflict prevention through affirmative engagement on sustainable development, on climate change, on COVID, public health, and human rights. You know, these, are, uh, the, these are getting at the underlying root causes of conflict. Um, uh, and, and, and this is an area where uh, I'd love to see more. Thanks, Frank. I'm very sorry that we don't have time to take more questions. Um, but I would like to thank uh, Sonia Botman, uh, Sam Martel, uh, with the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs at the UN for their behind the scenes work on matters related to the peninsula. I'd like to thank uh, Steve Norper uh, from the Korea Society. I'd like to thank Tom Burns, the president of the Korea Society for his support for these uh, NCNK TK Korea Society events. Jonathan Corrado also, uh, Claire Callahan, Hand and also Esther M from NCNK. Before I turn it over to Steve for any final remarks, I just have some questions. Um, let's, let's look into the future, 30 years from today. Um, will the peninsula be reunified? If so, will that occur under Kim Jong-un's plan for reunification? Or will reunification occur under the plan of South Korea? Or Will the South and the North um, develop their own unification plan, which perhaps would implement a jointly agreed cooperative threat reduction program where both countries would place their defense assets on the table and arrive at a Korea first peninsula defense policy? With that, I'm just asking questions. I'll turn it over to Steve. A wonderful questions for future dialogue. Thank you, Keith Luce and NCNK. Uh, thank you to our panelists, to Teresa Whitfield and to Frank Januzzi. Uh, and thank you to all of you who have joined for this uh, interesting discussion uh, as we mark the 30th anniversary of joint Korean membership in the United Nations. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Keith.